Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, my talk on domain driven design and especially on the part of strategic design, um, which I'm actually going to split in two parts. First, we do the theory, and then we do a practical example of various, uh, I would say, patterns, things that are being discussed in strategic design, and uh, in terms of a Spring Boot application. Uh, so before we're off to the beers, um, we obviously um, will have one more talk. Just a few words about myself. My name is Michael Plöt. I work as a consultant for a company called InnoQ, and you can follow me on Twitter, at BitBoss is my handle, and I will post links to codes and slides uh, right after the talk for your reference. So let's talk about this Spring Boot example um, application. Um, just one thing, it is about a puck, a very uh, business-driven puck. And don't be afraid, it's not going to be an old-school pet store or something like that. Um, before we go into that, before we're talking about this fat puck over there, um, let me give you a quick disclaimer. Uh, I am by far not the inventor of domain-driven design. I'm just a loud mouth that's running around in conferences and speaks about a couple of things. Um, all credit, uh, especially for all the patterns, the ideas of the bounded context and strategic designs, obviously goes to Eric Evans and Vaughn Vernon. Uh, if you haven't read their books, please do so. They are absolutely fantastic. Okay, now, when we dwell into the topic of uh, strategic design, um, we will obviously stumble across the bounded context. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I guess most of you have already uh, been dealing with microservices, are currently in projects that are evaluating microservices, have read a couple of things about microservices. One of the standard sentences next to probably the Conway's Law reference is obviously something like that. Please structure your microservices, your applications along bounded contexts. And from the bounded context on, um, the rabbit hole actually goes a little bit deeper um, because domain-driven design gives us also a tool called context map or context mapping, which helps us in um, sketching out the structure of application landscapes, and which is a very, very useful technique um, for evaluating, let's say, transformations or migrations of existing applications uh, towards a, let's say, more modern, more cloud-based, more cloud-native, whatever buzzword you want to have here, um, architecture. And along this context map, there are a couple of patterns. And um, let me be very clear, not all of them are best uh, practice patterns. Some of them are actually quite horrible patterns, but they exist in existing landscapes. So if you're dealing with uh, grown legacy applications and so on, things aren't nice all the time. Actually, the contrary is often the case. So let's start off and talk about uh, the bounded context. What is this bounded context? Uh, you see those gray spots on the, on the wall uh, behind me. And basically, the bounded context says that every sophisticated business domain obviously consists of a couple of, let's say, separate parts, separate ideas. Let's say we do an insurance application. Uh, the applying for an insurance, the entering of your personal data, the calculation of the insurance fee, and uh, the claims stuff against an insurance, those are quite different sorts of things that need, to be, that need to play together. And each of these contexts has models, and it can, can contain other subcontexts. The model is the way that we see, or the way that we model our business. And the most important thing about the bounded context is that it is at the same time the boundary 
for the meaning of a given model. And this is something that goes very contrary to, let's say, old school, centralized IT uh, department kind of thinking, where we say, ah, we need the central customer service. Everybody that deals with customers has to uh, integrate against this service, and this is the company-wide um, mandatory kind of data model. Uh, I mean, this led us to sort of inflexible architectures. And the boundary context delivers a different approach to that. It says basically, hey, go ahead and, and go um, take care of the business domain, of the business context that you have first, and then take a look at the outside. Um, and I think it's very easy. Let's do a little example. Basically, we are at the awesome Spring I.O. conference. First day is nearly over. Everybody's thirsty for the beers in the evening. And uh, the second day will be great as well, I think. And Zergi, who deserves a lot of credit for setting up this awesome conference, obviously needed some support in, in creating the conference. So they, I, I just claim that now, they have three bounded context. One is the reservations, where we all signed up for the conference. We said, hey, my name is Michael Plöd. I come from a company called InnoQ. My Twitter handle is BitBoss, uh, and so on and so forth. And I pay with this, and so on. And that's the reservation part. So here I am as a customer, and I sign up for the conference. So basically, stuff that's interesting to me here is my name payment details, the company, my address, for instance. Now, this event has to be managed in a certain way. Obviously, there, is, there are several tracks going on in parallel. And the organizers of the conference need to, need to see which topic with which speaker to place in which room. So for instance, if uh, Rod Johnson would be speaking in parallel to me right now, I obviously wouldn't be in that room. I'd be in some other room, uh, a way smaller one, because Rod would fill the place up, or uh, the keynote with Stefan, and so on. So obviously, there needs to be a management of the event. And we all have different, let's say, requirements in terms of food. Let's say some people have a preference. They want vegetarian food. Others eat meat. Others need gluten-free food, and so on and so forth. So in this context, with the event management, I do not, of course, I am here as a customer. I have a certain preference to go to various sessions and to listen to certain speakers, to certain topics, yes. But I am not very interesting as a customer itself in this context. I am basically a occupied seat in the audience at a given time um, in a given session. Or I am a walking vegetarian. I am a walking meat eater. It doesn't matter if the vegetarian is Michael Plöd or not, for instance. So I do not take care of the name, the payment details here. And every conference also has badges. I mean, we all have these things here, like I see a couple of those in the audience as well. And um, basically, these need to be printed as well. So here, I also, the customer itself isn't very important. It's important that everybody has one and that the right stuff is printed on the badge. But I, I, for instance, go for name, a job description, and a Twitter handle for the badges. Now, putting this all together, um, we can see that each bounded context has its own view on a customer, its own take on me as a customer, for instance. And this is a very, very big enabler for independent microservices. So if you really want to go for independence, you should start with decentralizing your model. If you work with a strongly centralized model, um, like the company data model or something like that, um, you obviously will have a hard time increasing your delivery speed, uh, your independence in terms of releasing, and so on and so forth. And please take a close look at the name here. The name is present in the reservations and the badges context. Here I can take or I can make a educated decision. I can say I centralize a couple of things if I want to, or I say I, I go separate ways. I, I, I work with uh, replicated data at some, some point here. 
Um, now, another example for the bounded context. This is a, has been a very data-driven example, for instance. Another example, imagine driving your car. Um, an option to model a car for personal driving would be car get motor dot start. Is that the correct model for the context personal driving? What do we usually do? We lock up our car, we enter, and we push some button. Do we turn on the motor by that? No, we're turning on the car because we're also turning on the GPS system, um, some assistance systems, uh, uh, navigation, and so on and so forth, ESP, and, and so on, but also the motor. And the car knows how to start itself. So a better model for that would be car.start, and the car knows how to start itself. Now, when I am in a service center, my car needs to be checked or repaired. The, uh, the specialist of uh, the car company has a totally different view. They have a specialized view on the car. They take into, into account the various components, their dependencies, and so on. So another model that is more detailed would be a better model for the context of the service center, for instance. Now, taking that into account, um, one thing that a lot of people always say, and I agree with that, structure your microservices. So if you do Spring Boot microservices, structure them along bounded contexts. That's a pretty good rule in terms of the upper coarse grained um, side of things. Um, if you want to have more fine grained microservices, there's another construct which is part of the technical design or the internal building blocks uh, of domain driven design. Um, uh, the the fine-grained uh, bar at the lower end would be structuring microservices along aggregates, for instance. Now, let's take a look at the context map. The context map brings those bounded contexts in context. So, um, because as, uh, an isolated view on bounded contexts doesn't give us, give us a very good overview of the systems. Obviously, we just see some islands somewhere, but we don't see any, let's say, connecting lines between them. Mm. And here, uh, in my eyes, um, the domain-driven design aspect goes way further than, than what we usually see in a lot of enterprise architecture uh, drawings, like the enterprise architects. Um, they usually take a look at which systems are communicating with each other through which interfaces. But that is something where things usually stop. But uh, what, what they are actually missing in my eyes, or many teams are missing in my eyes, is the fact that um, there is also a given propagation of models between them. Let's say I, uh, I have a, let's say, e-commerce system, and I talk uh, and I communicate with a logistics provider. And the logistics provider has a given model on their interface, and they give it to me. When I say, hey, give me the status of my parcel, I get a status model back. And it's quite interesting what I can do with it. I can just take it and say, hey, that's good. I work with that in my code as well. Uh, or I can say, no, I want to transform this into something that is more s suitable to my, my stuff, to, to the stuff that I want to do there. And um, in my eyes, this is a very, very great starting point for future uh, transformations. Um, let's start off with these patterns that we can put along the lines here. Um, the first pattern is the shared kernel. Um, a shared kernel is something that you, for instance, see when two applications are communicating uh, with each other through proprietary binary protocols, such as, let's say, old school RMI, old school EJB remoting, but also through technologies that have been very strongly supported in the early days of Spring, for instance, Burlap, Hashian, and so on. These were basically binary protocols that were communicating with each other. Um, who in the audience still has an application with RMI, Hashi, and Burlap or something going on? 
Ah, OK. Um, another question regarding the shared kernel. Who has applications in place that are integrated through a common database? Ah, OK, quite a few folks. And this is also a shared kernel. You can say, oh, they are not communicating a lot with each other. Yes, very nice, but when they all go against the same tables in the same schema in the same database, you're obviously moving your shared kernel from your code down to the database. And this is also a very uh, interesting thing um, when, when you talk about uh, event-driven systems, event-driven architectures. Everybody now says event-driven is an awesome way to decouple things. Absolutely true. But if you put a lot of payload in your domain events and stuff, you run quite an interesting risk of having a shared kernel, an event-based shared kernel as well. I will discuss these aspects uh, in more detail in my workshop tomorrow when we talk about domain events. So who's interested, you're happy. I'm glad, I would be glad to see you there again. Now, the next three patterns, the customer supplier, conformist, and anti-corruption layer are typical patterns that often occur when you have a synchronous communication between two applications. So let's say we are calling against, with our REST template or fine client or whatever, against some REST resource. And the system that is providing this resource, that's providing this, uh, the, um, the service, so-called so the service provider, is often referred to as the upstream system, upstream. The consuming system is often referred to as the downstream system. Why is that? Um, Imagine the call from the downstream system is coming up, but the model is flowing down to the downstream system. The, the context map strongly focuses on the model. Now, why upstream, downstream? I'm from Germany. I come from a city called Nuremberg, and there is a river, the Pegnitz, going through Nuremberg, and it's flowing over to our neighbor city, Fürth. Um, Fürth and Nuremberg have quite a rivalry, like many smaller cities that are next to each other do have. Now, if I go ahead and put a lot of sewage into the Pegnitz in Nuremberg, the sewage is flowing down to Fürth. People in Nuremberg would say where it belongs. Perfect. Um, but. Um, that's the reason. If you have a bad model, you would run the risk that the bad model is flowing down like the sewage down the river into the other system. And now you can deal with this in, in, in various ways. The first way to deal with that is through a customer supplier relationship. Um, this customer supplier relationship is uh, something that also takes into account a, a lot of organizational parts. So as you can see, this context map heavily focuses on existing systems. And it doesn't stop at the software or the techniques or stuff like that. It also takes into account communication. So this is very, very, um, um, this, this goes hand in hand with Conway's law, for instance. Uh, in the customer supplier relationship, the two teams that are integrating with each other, they are talking to each other. So I would be going up to somebody and say, hey, sorry, yes, you want to change your interface, but me as a consumer, I'm really sorry. We have absolutely no capacity to deal with these changes. And I can stop you from changing your model. So that's the veto right of the customer. Uh, this can also be some overly aggressive behavior by certain managers. Or it can also happen when there is, in general, a very constructive discussion between the two teams. So in this case, there is a lot of communication going on between the teams, but the consuming team has a certain degree of a veto right. This is totally different with the conformist. The conformist, in this case, the downstream team, just takes whatever they get from the providing system. So there is no discussion. 
either because they are not able to discuss with them for political or commercial or whatever reasons, or because they, they think the stuff that they provide is really awesome, is really good, and they say, hey, this fits perfectly to my model. I myself have built a very, very bad conformist a couple of years ago. Um, as a hobby and a, let's say, coding playground, I run an online music magazine. And the topic of tour dates is always something that our readers want, but it's very cumbersome for us to enter. Uh, so we went against a service, we took a look uh, what's out in the market, we found one with a great interface, a uh, great model uh, for these concerts, and we conformed to them. I said, that's awesome. This is the model that I also do in my persistence layer, my view layer, and so on and so forth. Now, unfortunately, they have stopped their service from one day to another. So I was stuck conforming to a model that was obviously obsolete. Now, what could be a solution here? The solution could be the so-called anti-corruption layer. The anti-corruption layer is basically a mapping layer or some mapping microservice eventually as well, especially if you go against very, very old school legacy systems. This might be a very interesting idea for you. And the anti-corruption layer goes ahead and transforms the external, the upstream model to the internal model. Those can be a few lines of code. It can be a sophisticated transformation layer, or it can even be a certain microservice that just has the job to, to protect the microservice landscape from bad models from the outside in integration scenarios. Um, I have actually solved my music magazine model dilemma with a new anti-corruption layer against uh, the new system. Now, something that we actually want to have in a lot of microservice architectures, and especially when we are talking about event-driven systems, is something like separate ways. We want to be absolutely decoupled from each other. We do not want to talk a lot between the two applications. And there is a high degree of independence between the two applications. Um, this can obviously be achieved by the context not having anything to do with each other. Huh. Easy. But in, in the case of uh, integration scenarios, I would, when you do the analysis of these things, what I would do is um, I would take into account um, asynchronous communication between two systems for this one, and especially when you take a look at how they decouple against the events or the messages of the messaging system as well. So there needs to be a category for that, and that is something that I would often put into the uh, separate ways category. The other two ones are, let's say, upstream system patterns. The open host service is actually quite easy. It is nothing but a service, uh, but a system providing access through a dedicated interface. So your REST controllers, your, your web services, and so on, they all fall into the category of the open host system. So there is not a lot to explain there. Um, the other thing is, through these interfaces, a certain part of the internal model of the upstream system gets published to the outside, and that is also referred to the published language. So that's the, the, the part of the model that we publish um, to the outside. Now, let's take a look at these things in a little bit of practice. Now, this puck is running a bank. He's a banker. And he says, OK, I want to sell some loans. And um, he, over the time, hired some folks, some spring folks, to build him up um, landscape uh, for that. And um, you can actually download or, or clone or star or fork the code on GitHub. Um, so if you're interested in that and doing the exercise, for instance, with a couple of your colleagues, um, be my guest. It's all under Apache 2 license. And let's take a look at um, this application right now. now I'll put you um, 
on my screen. So here, hello. Ah, here we are. So basically, um, what we were talking about here is a web application right now, which is um, running on a Cloud Foundry. So you see that's my Cloud Foundry instance, a couple of services, a couple of routes, um, and the application. And um, basically, the application looks in a way that we enter our term, let's say for 12 months, 1,200 euros, the per pace, buy food for the puck, which obviously gives him a, this credit request a very good scoring, I'm sure. So we earn, let's say, 5,000 euros. We get a little bit of child benefit. Uh, we pay 1,000 euros of rent. Um, I enter my first name, last name, uh, street, let's say, our office in Munich. Munich. And uh, finally, I do perform a scoring. And as you can see, um, this landscape here uh, consists of five applications. The credit agency, a credit application, uh, a customer, customer contact, and a scoring application. And these applications are integrated um, as follows. Um, now, the integration looks uh, something like this. So the credit application is a very central application here, and it triggers a scoring. The scoring talks to a credit agency, to an external one, and we're talking to a customer, and there's some, this customer contact thing is sort of sitting to the side. Now, this is something that we often, in a little bit more complex way, see um, in, uh, let's say, enterprise diagrams. I'm sure a lot of you folks have seen these big printed paper things hanging in various offices. And the problem is that, that the thing that we see here are only call stacks. We only can see in this kind of representation how the systems are communicating with each other, but we do not see the the, the, the propagation of the models. Now, let me go into the code for this application. Um, the, the central application is obviously the Spring Controller, and please be aware, this is no Spring Boot best practice application. In no ways. I've built in a couple of really bad and nasty things just for the demonstration purposes. I also made that very clear in the readme file, so please don't blame me what sort of best practices I'm promoting. No, I don't. Um, so the, the first step here is the string index method. Not too interesting, basically um, the stuff that's happening there is, wait a minute, is this. Index, not very interesting. The next step is I fill out uh, my, my request purpose, more food for the fat puck. And I enter my financial uh, situation here, and I jump over to the next method. That's save step one. What we see here is some, let's say, spring data stuff that's going on, some process containers. So we're still stuck into our internal world. We're still stuck in the credit application here. Now, the next thing that can happen is in safe step two. So over there, I enter my personal details. I, I just put in some data there, whatever, and I proceed. Now, now it gets interesting. So basically, what we have is um, we see some customer client over there. Now, this customer client, what is that? Ah, it's a web service gateway. So obviously our customer application is providing an open host service in, in the form of a web service. Now, um, in this client, I see uh, two simple methods, from internal to external model and 
from external to internal model. So we're basically mapping the customer. Here it is a very stupid and very simple mapping, but that is an indication for an anti-corruption layer. It can be more sophisticated, of course. This is a very stupid anti-corruption layer for the simplicity's purpose of such a presentation. But basically, um, here we are transforming one object, one model to another op uh, model, right there. Now, let's go ahead and uh, go a little further. So basically, we have uh, done our thing with the customer. Um, we, we, we update our process container, the credit application form, and we move over to the next thing. Um, now, the next thing that is happening is this one down there, perform scoring. Oops, sorry, here. I really need to work on my web design skills. Now, we've performed the scoring, which is in, in this block here. Now, here I am building up an object called scoring input. I add some stuff for the scoring, for the calculation of the thing, and I talk to a scoring service here. Now, this scoring service is an interface, but the interesting part, please take a look at the package. Scoring shared, what's happening with this interface? Let's take a look at the uh, configuration here. Um, I, you see, we have a Scorian Hessian um, configuration, and this scoring shared part, this uh, scoring service and the scoring input, uh, where are they actually located at? Ah, they are in this shared kernel library down there, together with a color, some input, a result, an agency color, and an agency result. So what does that mean for the, um, for the combination of the credit application and the scoring system? It is a shared kernel, obviously. So um, now let's jump over to the scoring system and take a closer look at that. Um, at this one. So I go to the uh, scoring service here. Let's take a look at the POM file, and obviously we see the scoring share kernel being referenced there as well. Now, um, this scoring service in there, wait a minute. This scoring service contains some horrible spaghetti code, but in the spaghetti code, we're ramping up a REST request with the REST template um, going against um, a credit agency server. So obviously, the credit agency is providing us with a RESTful interface to perform some some scoring themselves. You know, credit agency, they collect customer data and they say, I am credit worthy, I'm trustworthy, or I have failed on my last three loans and I shouldn't be granted some credit or some loan in the future. And uh, basically, this one um, is going over there with the REST template. And um, the interesting part here is when we, t when we take a look at the response body, that we get at the response. We are taking out an agency result here, this one. And taking a closer look at the agency result, it gives us a couple of warnings and color and some scoring points and so on. And what we do with this agency result, we immediately put it onto our own result object and hand it out directly again to the scoring service. So this means that, um, or this is a very strong, things like these are a very strong indication that there is a conformist relationship between our scoring service and the credit agency. Just keep that in mind for a second. And uh, when I go back to my uh, credit application controller, um, uh, we do the scoring, we put out the scoring, and then we, we, we display the scoring result. 
Now, one thing that is very interesting here is this convert and send method against the Redis template. Obviously, there is some sort of a messaging going on somewhere in this application as well. So we have a REST template, which is sending some credit application approved, credit application declined event. And the same is actually also valid in this application scenario for our customer. The customer uh, is also sending around, uh, where is it? Where is this event? Hello. Ah, okay, it's not there, okay, whatever. So we're basically sending out events. Now, who might be consuming those events? The customer contact part. You remember the, 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 the isolated thing? In there, we are, for instance, going ahead and we have a couple of event receivers. Credit application approved, declined, customer created. Now, in this customer created event receiver, um, I get a message of a customer created event, and from this event, this looks like it has the complete customer in its body. ID, first name, last name, street, and so on. And I'm transforming that to an address, which I'm just saving. I'm not interested in the complete customer. I just take out a few bits and pieces there, and I store it in my own database. So I'm working with replicated data here. And this is a very strong indication of the customer contact part and the customer part going separate ways. Now, and this address comes in very handy when we, for instance, have the credit application approved event. Because here, we receive uh, the event that the credit application has been approved, and we're looking up the address for the customer in order to send them a contract, for instance. So that is also separate ways going on there. Now, putting all this uh, stuff together, let's repeat what we have seen. So far, we've just seen the call stacks. Now, when we remove that, we obviously see there is some event, some messaging stuff going against the customer contact part. And what you usually do when you work with uh, such a context map in your project, the first thing you do is you put the upstream downstream um, notations here. What's an upstream system in terms of a communication? What's the downstream system in terms of the communication? After that, I usually go ahead and try to identify which upstream systems actually provide an open host service. So in this case, it was the credit agency with its REST resource interface. It was the customer um, with their web service interface. And on the scoring side, we had a shared kernel. That's something we have identified here. Now, on the other consuming relationships, we found out that scoring is, con is a total conformist to the credit agency. Absolutely. It took the agency result, didn't transform it in any way, it just put it, turned it into its own result and gave it further down uh, to, the, uh, to the credit application. And between the customer and the credit application, we've seen an uh, anti-corruption layer. And obviously, we saw separate ways between customer, customer contact, and customer and credit application. Now, has anyone identified the real, I mean, we saw a lot of bad things in this code, obviously. Who has a guess on what is the worst thing in this context map? Imagine we're switching the credit agency. We're moving from credit agency A to credit agency B, and they have a totally different model. In the, in the view with the uh, communication lines only, where we just saw the call stacks, we would have thought, ah, very easy. We just adjust the scoring and everybody, uh, everything's good. And this is exactly not the case. If I go ahead and change things in the external model of the credit agency, they will propagate 
down to the credit application. Typical thing that you usually see in, uh, in a lot of projects or in, in transformation projects is uh, something like um, you start off the, with the project, everybody's enthusiastic, and after, let's say, three months, there is a very serious meeting, everybody's looking grumpy, hmm, dear boss, we found out that we have to adjust the credit application as well. And this is something that's very bad in terms of transformation. So if you want to go ahead and, and transform this landscape towards a microservices world, a good first step would obviously be to pull out the customer. Uh, and then to deal with the credit agency, the scoring, and the credit application together. So this strategic design stuff gives you a lot of, um, I would say, opportunities here. Um, before I go into that, I want to show you quickly a totally different approach on the topic, which is heavily separate waste-driven. Now, the same application, again, or a, a slight variation. So, um, sorry. Again, I'm applying for a loan here, and, and what you can see here is I have an application status. Um, if I have a number generated, a credit application sent, a customer created, and so on. In this case, I am applying for a loan, and suddenly, as a status, I get a generated number. I enter my credit details. And I enter my financial situation. I go back to the status. Oops, sorry. Yes, I want to go with this one. Credit application sent. Let me go back and add a customer. First name, Michael, whatever, 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 whatever. Boom. I create the customer and I say, we will go back to you. Now, let me show you an alternative take on that. This project will be uh, published on GitHub tomorrow after my event uh, workshop as well. This thing works heavily with uh, Spring Cloud Stream Rabbit and with domain events. So basically, all these things, there is no or nearly no synchronous communication between all the different parts, it's completely event-driven with various flavors. For instance, um, this one is fired, firing a credit application number generated event. Boom. And uh, an, a context that is interested in that is the credit application, for instance. So right here, you see uh, in terms of my income and message listener, I verify some uh, of the received uh, credit application numbers and I, f I also fire uh, my own events. So for instance, uh, in terms of an external event, a credit application entered event. This is something I'm firing from the credit application and which then we can see uh, in this credit application sent thing. When I move over to the customer side, now um, when I create uh, the customer in this uh, microservice over there, um, there's a, an, a very interesting flavor to that. For you two to work uh, strategically with going separate ways. Um, I have a customer created event, and this event only contains an URL to the customer. And there's two ways to obtain the customer for consumers. One way is to go for the URL, which is just nothing but a link to the following REST controller, where I can obtain the customer. Upon receiving an event, I just take out the customer and do something with it. But this also contains, and that is, a, in my eyes, a very interesting flavor for, let's say, semi-synchronous uh, microservices. This one also implements a so-called Atom feed. So here, you see, we have a new customer through an Atom feed. Uh, with the URL where I can obtain the customer from. 
whom, and I get the customer. And there can be microservices that are pulling from the feed, for instance, or for security, if they failed on a synchronous request against the REST resort, there is still the way, the op option to pull from the feed. And this is a highly decoupled way to implement the whole application. So now talking about a best practice, what would you say is the best practice? Obviously the latter one, because it's more decoupled, uh, highly independent, and we're also not uh, just always taking everything into the domain events. For instance, the way to go with the feed or adding some URL where you can obtain further data from an event is a very intelligent way to, to go ahead and, and deal with decoupled services. Because in this scenario, you do not have to deal a lot with resilience. You do not need service lookup or anything like that. All these, all these things in synchronous microservice landscapes are not needed for that. And I would say, especially Spring Cloud Stream for Kafka and for Rabbit is a really great and very, very simple enabler for these kinds of things. So if you're interested in digging really deep into this example um, and to see how, how, which modeling options you have, how you can really go ahead for separate ways in your strategic design, I'd like to in invite you to my workshop tomorrow, which goes for two hours, where we really dig deep and also a lot into the technical stuff for Spring Cloud Stream and so on and so forth. And um, this is something we're going to discuss tomorrow in a lot of detail. Now, I do not want to prevent you from getting beers. Um, we have, I I'd say, three minutes left for questions. Are there any questions? There is no questions? Yes, a question. Wait a minute. Ah, you have a microphone. It's from uh, the view of the context map. Yes. Um, there's still the coupling uh, in, in the new event-driven architecture, isn't it? Um, there is a certain coupling, but I would say um, I, I'm not a very big friend of saying uh, coupled and not coupled. It's just the degree of coupling that you can reduce. In, in the moment you do a synchronous call, in my eyes, you have a very high degree of coupling. In the moment you go asynchronous, you lower the de degree of coupling. That's also the reason why I like the loosely word loosely coupled. It's n not coupled at all is the wrong thing. It's looser coupled. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think in, in, uh, in the terms of domain-driven design, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the model is yeah. still, uh, yeah, you, can, uh, you cannot uh, exclude this. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, you, you need a certain coupling on the model, but there are certain techniques in order to, to make it not that highly coupled between two contexts. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. Uh, I'll be around tomorrow um, as well on the conference. I'll be at the bar tonight for some beers. So if you have some further questions, come up to me, ask questions. I'll post links to slides and code on Twitter. Follow me at Bitboss is my name. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.